we identified the parts that a lot of protocols, a lot of networks are starting centralized because decentralization journey is so hard and it's so un unoptimized or start with the really subpar validator set and suffer for that. If you have like a million nodes, it's suboptimal. Decentralization is something that really expensive for people to maintain. It's really hard to operate. Our basic job was to create uh, an alignment of incentives for new protocols. So they, when they decide to launch centralized or with proof of authority or white listing of operators, they decide on full-fledged uh, decentralization immediately. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Brian Crane, and today I'm speaking with Misha, who is the co-founder and CEO of Symbiotic. Symbiotic is uh, a restaking, staking protocol uh, and yeah, it's a very interesting new paradigm. So I'm excited to speak with Misha about that. But just before we get into that, we'd like briefly like to share a bit about our sponsors this week. If you're looking to stake your crypto with confidence, look no further than Course One. More than 150,000 delegators, including institutions like BitGo, Pantera Capital, and Ledger, trust Course One with their assets. They support over 50 blockchains and are leaders in governance on networks like Cosmos, ensuring your stake is responsibly managed. Thanks to their advanced MEV research, you can also enjoy the highest staking rewards. You can stake directly from your preferred wallet, set up a white label node, restake your assets on Eigenayer or Symbiotic, or use the SDK for multi-chain staking in your app. Learn more at chorus.one and start staking today. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a collective dedicated to advancing a decentralized future. Gnosis leads innovation with circles, Gnosis Pay, and Metri, reshaping open banking and money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they're building a more resilient, privacy-focused internet. If you're looking for an L1 to launch your project, Gnosis Chain offers the same development environment as Ethereum with lower transaction fees. It's supported by over 200,000 validators, making Gnosis Chain a reliable and credibly neutral foundation for your applications. Gnosis DAO drives Gnosis governance where every voice matters. Join the Gnosis community in the Gnosis DAO forum today. Deploy on the EVM compatible Gnosis chain or secure the network with just one GNO and affordable hardware. Start your decentralization journey today at Gnosis.io. Cool. Thanks so much for taking the time, Isha. I'm really excited to speak with you. I think uh, restaking is, you know, as someone who's been working in staking for a long time, it's a very interesting new concept. It's an interesting kind of, you know, conceptual evolution of where staking may go. At the same time, it's like totally at the beginning. Uh, you guys had a lot of like very interesting ideas. So I'm, I'm excited to speak with you about that. But maybe I'm curious, maybe we can just like start with a little bit your background and your journey. Like how did you get into crypto? And what was your journey been? Yeah, I like I was interested in, interested in crypto for a while. Uh, I think since uh, 2011 or something. Uh, in and out, uh, I I learned about this electronic money concept uh, and were was really impressed uh, because like what 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 not to be impressed with the uh, decentralized and uh, unstoppable money. Uh, everything else, I, I I knew little about like how the institutions and how uh, regulations work because nobody knew that back then. Like it, it wasn't for like average consumer to know how like how people are like how banks are gonna be like uh, uh, included or excluded from the SEPA or SWIFT networks. Like nobody knew about those networks before. Like uh, you 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 didn't if you didn't do like. Uh, uh, cross-border payments or something like that you were like basically going visa to visa payments so yeah uh, it was a really interesting concept uh then uh, like i tried mining bitcoin for for a few like weeks or days i think but like it, it you couldn't do anything with that except like trade on uh, mountain gox or something like that uh, there were not no actual exchanges just one i think uh there, there was no DeFi. there was nothing to actually do by spe but speculate on one uh, like asset pair uh so yeah like i i i uh, i turned that off for a while and then returned when the i like ico and ethereum 
uh, started to take off. And that's where like the interesting part began because you, are, you can actually do something. Uh, you could, uh, I don't know, invest into ICO, like ICOs, you could uh, support uh, interesting protocols because like donations were like really huge back, back then before ICOs. People just wanted something to be built and they had like a lot of mined uh, uh, Bitcoins or Ethereums. So you just like go to Bitcoin talk forum and uh, just donate to people without expecting them to like do something for you just to see where it, where it, where it goes. Ethereum was back then, like it was like seven or like five, five bucks uh, a piece. Uh, so people were like spreading it around and then it grew by like 100% and then like 10, 10 uh, I don't know, like a thousand percent. Uh, and a lot of people that were building protocols realized that this is like an actual funding mechanism. What's the origin story of Symbiotic? Well, we were working on state mines uh, with Algis. We found it, uh, it's my co-founder for, uh, for Symbiotic as well. We were working on state mind with the goal uh, of uh, making our part, of, like our industry a bit bigger uh, by like make it safer, protecting people and trying to secure protocols, uh, networks, like we, we helped uh, blockchains as well as rollups uh, secure their networks and as well as like big, huge DeFi protocols. Uh, and uh, yeah, we analyzed a bunch of stuff. Like how do we, we had a team of around like 25 people with us working on securing every part of the industry. So we analyzed like, can we help secure compilers more? Uh, so we helped Viper, uh, like wrote like a fuzzer for them and made like a security assessments of that, found like several bugs. Uh, then we realized like, okay, like there is a node code, right? We have multi-client for that, differential fuzzing, other tooling. So like this is semi-covered. Uh, okay, what can we do next? Or, like we have RPC nodes, RPC nodes like secured by this, this and this. Uh, and like we went through every every part of the industry, like basically every interaction that user can have with blockchain. So like PBS and everything like that. And uh, identified parts that that are needed to, to to make our like development sustainable, because for industry it sometimes takes like uh, I don't know like uh, from one hundred to one thousand dollars to get a really like quality participant, and then immediately like uh, hundreds or thousands of them are gone because uh, like there is some vulnerability or something wiped out from like the the productive part of our crowd so at some point we realized like to for make it to make it sustainable uh like we identified the parts that a lot of protocols a lot of networks are starting centralized because decentralization journey is so hard and it's so un unoptimized or start with the really subpar validator set and suffer for that uh and we decided yeah it's a good time to start like the protocol that optimizes for that uh, and that's how we started uh, working on Symbiotic. Okay, so you said the protocol that optimizes for that. Maybe, yeah, describe like what is the problem that Symbiotic is trying to solve? Okay, yeah. Uh, basically, it, the Symbiotic is trying to solve uh, decentralization. Uh, decentralization is uh, like it's suboptimal. Everybody knows that redundancy is uh, like a step from uh, outside of optimum. You, the, the optimal setup is you have is one server that's controlled by you, that's deployed, uh, that's deployed in one place or like with, the, like with few backups. If you have like a million nodes, it's not, it's, it's suboptimal. Decentralization is something that, uh, that's really expensive for people to maintain. It's really hard to operate and uh, yeah, like our, our basic job was to create uh, an alignment of incentives and UX as well, like supporting tools uh, and uh, general support system uh, to make this journey easier, to make it this journey way more uh, easier, like way easier to digest for new protocols. So they when they decide to uh to launch centralized or with proof of authority or like with whitelisting of operators uh 
they decide uh, on full-fledged uh, decentralization immediately. Not a hard task because, like, again, it's physics. Uh, decentralization is, by definition, suboptimal. Uh, but I think we, we are on the right path to make it so that it's way easier and way more, uh, way, well, we're way more efficient for networks to use outside of. Okay, so you want to make decentralization easier and more efficient. I think most people think of symbiotic as like restaking protocol. What's the common, what's the connection between, you know, decentralization and making decentralization easy and restaking? Yep. Yeah, um, okay. Like again, the, the, the decentralization is suboptimal. You need to pay a lot of people, a lot of money to operate your network. Otherwise you can just pay yourself, uh, or not pay at all, get one server, uh, and operate your network if it's fully centralized. Not, not, it's not going to be a network, but like uh, pay one node to 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 operate your network. Uh, so the journey of decentralization is quite expensive and it's quite uh, hard. So you need to have like with the current with the current proof of stake uh, models, you need uh, to have something to stake first, right? Like you you need to launch your own token. Uh, for this token, you need to create like a, some legal basis because you you need that for you not to get sued after that uh, you need to have a legal basis you you need to spread it around uh with a lot of participants then you need to uh you need to you need to create enough liquidity for for the token price to be semi-stable you need to list it on multiple exchanges and then you can decentralize so you need to you need to create a lot of things and you need to like go through a long journey uh, before you even think about decentralization and then you need to find yourself an operator set uh, when you find yourself an operator set like it's you need to talk to like each company separately and that's when you actually can start testing traction and if you say like your token is say like uh, around 100 mil, it is general consensus, uh, total circulating supply. In general consensus, you can't onboard 10 billion USD in Tether immediately because you don't have the security base to support the circulating supply of tokens on, on your ecos uh, like in your ecosystem. Or you can't secure if you're like Oracle network, you can't secure 10, 10 100 bill of uh, TVL in other DeFi protocols with your price fit. So what restaking does is that it helps you like as a part of shared security, which we are like we are shared security protocol. So one of the primitives that we use is restaking. What it does, it enables you to get a wide economic base from the from the tokens that are actually stable that have like really good liquidity that are listed everywhere and immediately start testing your traction before all of these steps that i described like before this 6 to 16 months of development and like trying to to create enough of the stable economic base enough of the like the really good validator set and like the the mechanics of your tokenomics and everything like that you can start immediately and you can onboard a, a, a lot of money and really good operators immediately al almost. This is the goal at least for uh, for uh, shared security protocols. And like, again, it plays to the same narrative. You can do better while being suboptimal. So you can get enough enough UX improvement, enough go-to-market improvement, and now enough capital efficiency to counteract and even like receive a lot of a lot of benefits while being redundant and while being decentralized from the start. One point you're making, right, is that basically if you're launching a proof of stake network, right, it's expensive. There's a whole bunch of um overhead coordination finding operator set etc uh in the restaking case so if now a protocol goes to symbiotic and they say okay i want to launch some chain and i want an operator set and i want to have some economic security 
then I mean, generally they'll still use their native token, no, because they still need to provide some kind of incentive for this, or they can use points or other meca mechanisms for that. Like uh, they, they, it, it's not there. There might be optim like the, the optimization here might be achieved through V mechanics, so lockup period dual staking, uh, basket staking, a lot of other like fee model, straight up fee model for some networks that like would never need their token at all. Uh, we we are exploring these mechanisms as well. This is like a re really bullish concept, uh, but uh, for, for most like for totality of networks. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, novel mechanisms that are not gonna be like, they were not available at all before. You can you can shorten your journey by a lot, just not like launching your token immediately or launching it in like uh, some limited capacity while already testing traction of your idea or product market fit with uh, like a huge economic base. So one big benefit, right, that I, I can totally see is that, you know, you're making things a lot more flexible, right? Because Because so far, let's say, Actually, proof of stake has been pretty, pretty uniform in a lot of ways, right? There's some variation, right? Like for example, some protocols say, oh, the validators have to hold some self bond in their wallet and others can, can be delegated, you know, so there's some difference there, like let's say Tezos, a few others, but you know, mostly it's really the kind of Cosmos staking model, I think has been the most common where you know you have some people running validators, then people delegate to the validators, the validators charge some kind of commission, and then the voting power on the chain of all the validators is determined by the amount that's being staked. And then you know the protocol basically inflates the supply and it pays it to the people staking. So that's like really like the standard model that I think has been copied over and over again. What do you think are the problems with this, like from an economic and incentive perspective? Yeah, uh, well, like you, you were mentioned, you were mainly mentioning chains. It's really important for people to understand that, like we have oracles as well. We have uh, threshold networks that are like operating on completely different mechanisms. We have pre-conformer network, fast finality networks, other like networks that are not chain. They're still secured by stake and economic security, but they're not blockchains. They don't operate in, on the same principle. Every decentralized chain uh, can use, not, not the chain, every decentralized network, that's what we, why, why, they call, well, we, why we call them networks, can benefit from economic security if they have like some ability for validators to misbehave or operators to misbehave. So like slashing mechanism versus the reward mechanism. In terms of optimization, straight up optimization. Yeah, like uh, you, can, you can start immediately. Like uh, go to market optimization of six months is going to be a huge value proposition for a lot of people. And uh, Cosmos SDK that you mentioned, the Cosmos, uh, Cosmos chains that you mentioned, they, uh, e even with the like incentives, uh, how they are to develop for Cosmos ecosystem, they uh, reached a lot of uh, they they reached a lot of uh, actual use cases and uh, like a lot of teams that are building on this tech stack because they have an UX optimization that we are trying to achieve as well. Uh, just imagine if you have like registry that's going can be reused multiple times, network middleware, trust routes on Ethereum that can be reused multiple times, people launching with like with the same primitive or close primitive. Uh, networks that are operate with the same like tokenomics or with the same reward or like slashing model, they can reuse code each time that they, they, they launch. So it's not a like one to one journey. Uh, and like that's what brought a lot of people to Cosmos because their system can be reused. We are building that, but in more generalized way. Uh, so it like will encompass every decentralized network and bring optimization that, that is uh, reached through restaking, so you don't have to pay your validator that much or your operator that much because you're use, like, you have less, uh, less money to, to pay APY for, less amount of money. 
Yeah, and like while getting get go to market and like ty pure timing uh, optimization. So I, I feel this is actually a very interesting aspect of like the economics of restaking. And like one way I, so if you take like a typical Cosmos network, right? So let's say a tip or typical proof of stake chain, doesn't really matter. So let's say it has a market cap of 100 million and now it has uh, inflation of 7%. So let's say it pays 7 million a year to the stakers. But then of course, most of this is just people who hold the native token. They get more of the native tokens. So they're like, oh, I'm happy I have more tokens, right? I just, uh, you know, accumulate more tokens. And then you have something that is going to the validators who are actually doing the work of like running the chain. So let's say that is like, let's say it's like 7% on average. So now in such a chain, right? Let's say in this example, you'd have like half a million per year, which is actually paid to uh, the validators running the chain. The rest goes to back to the token holders. I mean, I see what one downside I see in this is that maybe the payments to the validators are very uh, uneven. Right, some make a lot because they have big stake. A lot of them might be running at a loss. But if you compare it to restaking, right? If now I'm have my native token and I pay it to, you know, Ethereum holders or Bitcoin holders or you know, somebody else who has some other asset and they just want to have more yield on their other asset, then you know, you have to assume that in most cases they're just gonna sell the token, right? And is this like going to lead to uh, sale pressure for this asset? So I'm curious how you think about that and like how you sort of deal with the, yeah, this aspect of, you know, the more you pay in rewards, the more sell pressure it creates in the restaking scenario. Yep. Uh... In actuality, uh, the highest amount of pressure that you can experience is when you pay in for the stake in your own tokens uh, when you launch natively. Because uh, just imagine, you have uh, first, uh, you're launching your own token. Uh, so like you usually your uh, annual APR is a bit higher than like for the classical assets because you need to like that there is more risk involved so like if for ethereum it's like 3.5 percent new networks usually pay up to like well 15 10 percent in some cases like so i would take like 10 percent as a as a metric uh so you pay 10 percent uh for the the amount of like the for the 100 mil that you uh you have you can't board a lot of money. You can't get generate a lot of fees. You can't bring B protocols because you're limited by the amount of like your market cap. So it's going to be slow growth for you. Like if you're not viral immediately, uh, it will take you a couple of years to get on board enough protocols, enough networks, like boost your uh, market cap that like you can actually onboard them. So like at least for like one bill or two bill. And it's like you're gonna be paying ten percent, uh, like on your tokens each time. So you're gonna be like diluting your tokens. Let's take the case of uh, like uh, using restaking. First, you can use mecha mechanisms of V tokens, points, or other mechanisms that to to postpone the actual sell pressure on your tokens by months or like year if if you have like really a uh, good uh, user base uh, that understands that. Uh, so no pressure at all in, in this optimization. You can use dual staking for the optimization of like and motivate people to stake your native to tokens to get this proportional amount of rewards to say Ethereum stakers. You can use other like million mechanisms for that. But let's let's imagine you don't like you don't you're not clever at all. You're not going to be using any of those. Uh, okay, like uh, uh, for Ethereum stakers, you can create, uh, like you, you can use uh, same ETH token, like say around five times, right? This is like the, the threshold that we are looking at right now. 
five times. Uh, so uh, each network, for you to get the same amount of uh, APR, uh, can like can provide APR, say like three times as low. So you only need to pay three percent for the amount of stake that you receive. But you can start with a couple of billions in Ethereum if your your system requires that. If it's an Oracle system, that's going to be like you already have like a good BD connections to say Aave or other protocols for them to use your price feed, and you immediately start with like your system secured by two bill. Yeah, you're going to be paying for like three percent for that in your token. But again, there are a lot of optimizations for that to counter the price pressure or eliminate it altogether, and you you test your product market fit on scale immediately while being safer than you would ever like be. So even without optimization, yeah, like restaking will uh, just divide like uh, by the order of like uh, by the restaking ratio, divide the amount of like sale pressure you are going to be experienced. So experience. I, I actually don't, yeah. I really don't agree with this. Like, let's take the example, right? Y you have a company and the company has shares. And now you do a stock split and now instead of one share, everyone has two shares. Like, did you really change anything? Not really, right? It's just everyone has twice as many shares. They're worth half as much. The market cap of the company is the same. Like, I think staking, like, on a very simple level, if you have, if you pay staking more, it's in your native token, two people already holding your native tokens, it's just kind of like a stock split. It's sort of like, now... There's a little caveat there, right? Which is that some people are probably going to need to pay taxes on their staking rewards and then they will have to sell some of it. I think that's, that is a factor, but still like you're, you know, for the most part, you're paying more rewards. It doesn't mean you have, it's not an actual cost because you're paying it to your token holders anyway. You're paying to a portion of your token holders. That's like start. You're splitting the stocks for like uh, less than half of your state, less than half of yeah, your Yeah, you, you, do, you do have some re redistributive effect. That's true, right? Where you're basically redistributing ownership from those not staking to those staking, which, you know, uh, you can think about whether you want that or not. It may not be bad, right? Because like, who are the people who are not going to be staking? It may be short-term holders, market makers, traders, things like that. People that are using this in DeFi, say, people who are like actually using token to like, and you need all of those. Like, I, I wouldn't like uh, value one more than the other. You don't want to pr proportion of like more than half of your tokens to be staked ever. Like this is that we had the systems that, that were designed specifically not to allow for that. Ethereum is trying to counter that like at, uh, at all costs because like that, that's, that's how you get that, that blockchains. Uh, no, like uh, the, the stake amount uh, first, yeah, like let's, let's, let's get, uh, like, uh, go argument by argument. So it's not a stock split because like only a portion of your shareholders are splitting their tokens. Okay, sure. It's different in this regard, like by a lot. Then, uh, like the actual mode of tra transport there is like validators and stakers sell their tokens all the time, not because of taxes, but because they want to hedge the risks and uh, they need capital. Uh, like no, like we 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 have analytics for that. Like uh, it's pretty like it's pretty well well researched. Uh, and yeah, uh, here uh, and it's like it it's really uh, like once you launch. Uh, and once you actually have stakers, uh, the mechanics of rewards uh, is uh, is kind of hard to update. Uh, for networks, uh, like for networks launching with restaking, it's a bit more flexible because they have like they, they have uh, they they have an economic security base that is outside of their own token immediately. They experiment without people actually ever risking their money because they have like Ethereum to to rely on for. At, for at least for bootstrapping phase. And then they can stimulate the, the same behavior, but with lockup periods and like a lot of other mechanisms that are gonna be doing the same thing that you, you just mentioned, but doing them on the algorithmic level. Not on like, oh, believe in our like operators and validators, they're not gonna be selling or stakers. 
they will like that's that's all they do uh as, no well except for like polka dot ones because most of them were like non non existent at the time they're like that accounts that accounts don't sell other than that yeah like you 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 can create systems that are way more sustainable than what we have right now because like there there there's going to be like mechanisms that are uh will reward the behavior that you've talked about and this actually will become like less of a payment yeah i definitely agree that like the flexibility here is very appealing right where you can like experiment with a lot of different now i i think my other thing here where i also have a bit of a i i disagree to some extent with one of the key narratives around restaking and you also like mention it you're like okay some chain launches and you know they only have like a hundred million market cap and you know that's somehow a problem and if you say like oh now you have like two billion that's sort of securing this chain it makes like a material difference i think in like you know in the history of proof of stake right we've had tons and tons of proof of stake network launch I'm not aware of a single proof of stake network that, you know, failed because, you know, the economic security wasn't high enough and then it got, you know, attacked or something like that. And, you know, you made the example of uh, oracles, right? Now, okay, you may have an oracle that's now securing a lot of value, but I mean, if you take the biggest oracle, Chainlink, uh, I mean, Chainlink for the longest time even though the Chainlink token had a huge market cap, it didn't actually secure any of the Oracle feeds, right? It was basically a POA system. Uh, or, you know, to give another example, uh, you know, there's like Noble Chain in Cosmos issuing a USDC. Again, there's not even a token there. It's, there's actually zero economic value. It's like a proof of authority chain as well. So I think even even in those systems where you do have like you know, some very high amounts of value at risk. You know, if, if Chainlink now said, okay, it's 10 billions of dollars is securing these oracles, does it really make a difference? Do people really care? So I, I, I feel like the, the degree, the number of cases where having like more economic security, that's like securing a system, being like, a major driver of success, I think it's extremely small. Yeah, it's not a driver of success. It's a driver of like, uh, first it's a perception driver. Uh, and then like the, the examples that you mentioned are, uh, yeah, like Chainlink where it was operating under pro authority for a long time. It's the first mover advantage. Now we have networks that are like actually fixing a lot of those. Because proof authority requires being permissioned. And being permissioned uh, requires decision making for every network, for every price feed, because you're the one who, who, who is making that decision. That's why like uh, new newcomers are like eating the cake of chain link in a lot of ways. Because on actual economic security, the permission the permissionless systems can be built. So we have like other optimization. Pro authority is not only bad because like it's unsafe, uh, which which that is. And uh, proof authority and small validator sets that are controlled by networks, they are not uh, like they're not uh, they're not like they they have like uh, examples where they stole people's money. Like I remember a few of those. I I need just need to remember names. There were like really small networks that tracked their users with the small operator set that was controlled by them. The biggest example of centralization of operators is EOS. EO it was like a long, long time ago. EOS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like uh, they had like operator set that was really small, and they were attacked by it multiple times. Uh, we had ex examples of that, and industry learned their lesson. Uh, now, like small cap low like low footprint networks they're not getting traction not because like they're not getting hacked they just get per per perception of not being safe enough 
Uh, and uh, for Oracle networks, yeah, that's why uh, Chainlink uh, were like uh, the perception that it was safe helped them to be market leader for a really long time. And now this perception can be counteracted by the actual economic model. So newcomers were really having a really hard time competing with Chainlink because of the perception and really go good track record. And this is like the, the flexibility and optimization on go-to-market. This really jumps uh, as, as uh, like innovation speed booster. Markets that were like gate kept by a reputation for a long time, as well as like the operator markets uh, as a close, a semi-closed club, they can be unlocked with risk taking because you can get the same economic security and the same, like you don't have to have the same reputation, but you can have the same economic security, actual economic security as the bigger networks immediately. And I think like this is really, really powerful. And uh, yeah, like, but those are like the Oracle network and POS chain, uh, they are that they're not like the flagship cases. They're really like, I, I hope I explained a bit like why does, why, why does, why, why is this important? Not only from the like pure security perspective, but from uh, the traction testing and flexibility perspective. But uh, let's say like you have say pre-confirmations or anything that like works with the like hundreds or hundreds of thousands or like millions of proposers, right? Be it pre-confirmations, be it MEV relays, be it something else. If you need a huge operator sets to be secured by some like by, by, by some tokens. If you just have staking, uh, you need to like for them to be secured, uh, I, I don't know, like by hundreds of billions of dollars, like the same as they use uh, for their like part of the, the, the stake that they're going to be using uh, for their actual proof of stake operations. And with this stake and you can be like secured, like a uh, hundred thousand uh, proposers can be secured by like one Ethereum or like 10 Ethereum. And that's going to be it. Uh, like we'll, we'll, we are still seeing the, the restaking cases emerging. But even like the worst case scenario proof of stake network, I like I explained how it can be like optimized a lot as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say let's talk a little bit about the architecture of Symbiotic. Like what does this system actually look like? And what are the different uh, yeah, components and, and actors in the system? Yeah. Uh, well, it has like basically three participants. Uh, first, the stakers uh, that so the, that give give their stake to to networks uh, through operators, operators, networks, and stakers. Networks require uh, economic security to launch uh, and decentralize their network. They are receiving that from stakers through operators with their operator set. And if network is okay, uh, like network is the arguably the most important participant. If it's okay with the amount of stake that they receive and uh, the amount of like the, the validator set that is attached to that, they uh, opt in and they uh, start, start to be operated by those operators through this stake. If any of the operators uh, violate some rules of the network, Network can slash them. If they don't, network can reward them. The, the role of restaking protocol or shared security protocol in our case is to make sure that once the, like the commitments are made, that this is the mode of work between those three, uh, that the com commitment are, commitments are uh, like commitments are followed. Okay, so you have stakers, operators, you have the networks. So let's talk through this from uh, the perspective maybe of the stakers and the operators. So if I'm somebody who wants to now stake and I want to earn, you know, additional rewards, maybe I have some other interests, like, I don't know, maybe I find some of the projects interesting, the building on Symbiotic or something like that. Like, what is the flow here? The, the staker will then choose some network to restake to and then, for example, choose uh, 
maybe some operator that they trust or how would the state, what does the staker experience look like? Yeah, uh, well, most of this, uh, this experience will go through LRTs. Uh, but if like, say an example of that, like the, the staker wants to, uh, to manage everything themselves, they will create a vault, a vault, uh, the vault will have, uh, like lockup period that corresponds to the networks that they want to, wants to stake to, uh, it will have, uh, its own or like separate resolver. That's basically the safeguard against uh, unlawful slashing. And through this resolver, like it's, uh, it will select the operator set that it wants to delegate to and the network it wants to opt in with this validator set. And once uh, this request is made, network can agree and uh, select this stake to be operated. Okay, so you mentioned a lot of it, stake will go through LRTs. Uh, LRTs meaning like liquid restaking tokens. Uh, for those who follow the eigenlayer, you know, you've had that there, like Etherfy, Renzo and stuff, getting uh, a lot of traction. How, how do you imagine uh, LRTs will work? And, and does this mean basically as a, as a staker, I want to benefit from, you know, I want to restake some assets. I want to use symbiotic. I would then just basically, for example, take my ETH and deposit it in an LRT and I get some sort of, I don't know, Renzo, Swell, Etherify, something LRT token. And then on the back end, what happens? On the back end, though, the, the stake uh, through the vault of LRTs is going to be uh, deposited into vault on symbiotic side, and it's going to be delegated to network through the operator set by the LRT uh, management management team. Yeah, and like we already have like around 12, 12 LRTs, so like this is how it's like this is a, a, not an unvalidated concept. Uh, we already receive most of our stake through LRTs because it's just like maybe more optimal that way for all, most users. So, and then the LRTs would basically, they would then decide, okay, which of these networks do we want to secure? They would then say, and they would have some existing operator set. Let's say they have like 10 operators or something and then they would say okay now we go to network a and we say okay we bring our 10 operators we bring 500 million dollars worth of economic security and basically negotiate some kind of compensation for that and the uh, network will receive several requests for that uh, from different lrts and we'll select the basket of LRTs, their own users, or like uh, the the yeah the some proportion of it. So say like five LRTs, uh, 250, 550, 2,000, 3,000 uh, users for outside of LRT, and th this is going to be the set of stakers from from the beginning of the network to be changed later. Right. So I think what is interesting is that LRTs kind of become this also collective like bargaining organization, you know, where they would like uh, negotiate uh, sort of on behalf of both the stakers and the validators or the operators. Yeah, they their job is going to be to fight for for the most optimal stake allocation. Yeah. I expect a lot of optimizations to come from LRT fights once they actually start. Yeah, because they are obviously also going to be in, uh, yeah, very serious uh, competition. Yeah, of course. Like the, there is limited amount of networks, at least from the beginning, and there is going to be not a lot of rewards for them, probably from the beginning as well. So like LRTs will will have to fight and choose and try to be onboarded into as many good networks as possible. Because other, other than that, they're the only ones like uh, spreading their token around and there is no like inherent reward beneath, like, beneath them at the base layer. And then 
you guys also have some plans, is my understanding, to... Because right now, basically, Symbiotic is a set of smart contracts on Ethereum. Of course, today, staking happens all over the place in many different ecosystems and networks. How do you imagine that, in many cases, Ethereum remains as this kind of place where some of this coordination happens of like stake and operators and LRTs or do you imagine that you know this will be kind of uh, expanded to different networks yeah symbiotic is on every network already like the, this, this is by design the fact that as our trust route is based on ethereum and we use like ethereum as like data availability and execution layer uh, it doesn't mean that much like we can, uh, we, uh, symbiotic is designed in a way that we can use uh, like tokens or on like almost any chain, and uh, like we don't have to transport them to Ethereum even. Uh, the assets on like Cosmos, the uh, chains, the, the assets on uh, like uh, on the Solana or any like almost any place else can be used. This is the unique feature of uh, restaking and like shared security, at, at least as how, how we designed it. Uh, the fact that you don't need immediate bridging or fast, rapid bridging, you just need to, to, to asynchronously slash something and make sure that something is still present in the escrow or some deposit contract on other chains. It enables you to, to use assets that are like outside of Ethereum easily. Uh, and that's how we designed. We have this collateral abstraction in the docs, like it's like a bit of a technical concept, but uh, basically like a lot of uh, a lot of uh, other outside ecosystems are building on us. Yeah, the registry is going to be stored on Ethereum, but like everything else uh, in terms of ecosystem, in terms of LRT, in terms of reward management and slashing can be done on their ecosystem without like any vampire attack from Ethereum or something like that. So uh, as current like as current thinking goes, we'll see about like the future, but there is no like actual need for symbiotic to be deployed anywhere anywhere else. Uh, we just lose like some networks of effect. So like let's say if you say like okay some Solana related thing would use symbiotic, you guys would not need to deploy some kind of smart contracts on Solana. As, yeah, as the will will uh, the, the the supply side for the liquidity will need to have some escrow contract or a deposit contract that uh, a burner yeah. contract that yeah that needs to be like unwrap and burn if if the message is received f uh, from the from the Ethereum side. But no, like the core of Symbiotic can stay on Ethereum, and it's like it, it does need to be deployed. As soon as you want to use some uh, like some uh, collateral from other chains, you just deploy the this the, like the, the simplest uh, of messaging layers when contract, and you're good to go. If you want to get have rewards on Solana as well, you'll need to deploy uh, like a Solana contract of rewards. Uh, but the registry is going to be taken from Ethereum. Because like actually you don't need uh, uh, like there there are there aren't a lot of requirements to the base layer for the restaking. It doesn't have to be like fast in terms of finality. It doesn't have to be uh, cheap. Uh, it just needs to be like as have as much of network effect as possible, and uh, to be like as efficient of orchestration layer as possible. And Ethereum is that. That's why we designed uh, Symbiotic to work on Ethereum L1. But uh, in actuality, like especially if like you have canonical bridge or something, or IBC, uh, you can use it anywhere else. You, you don't need to deploy the, uh, Symbiotic to every ecosystem. Like it's already there, basically. What about slashing? How do you imagine slashing to work? Well, it's going to be different for every asset, at least. Uh, like uh, we we are just exploring this this part of the wood slashing. Uh, uh, yeah, like it's uh, the the main part about it is that it's going to be it's going to be determined by networks. First of all, like this is the important part. You don't have to specify. Like there there is no one size fits all. 
for some networks, uh, like will uh, there there's gonna be like algorithmic slashing for some reason for some networks there are gonna be subjective slashing because you can't verify like the, the actual act of misbehavior. For other there there can be consensus slashing. The the fact we designed it in a really flexible manner so like network can 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 deploy that any in any way that they want. Uh, the tricky part for that was like how do we make it safer. And that's why we designed resolvers that are going to be uh, like uh, really important, at least for the beginning, to be uh, to 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 help mitigate some bug-related or like abuse-related uh, slashings. Uh, resolvers are going to be veto committee that are going to be standing between the network messaging uh, of slashing and the, the actual stake. Uh, they can be like again really flexible, algorithmic ones, proof ba based ones. Or so this also chosen by the network. Or... The, uh, the resolvers are chosen by both. Like they, they are chosen by the pair of uh, stakers and network. They both agree on that the resolvers that they can be connected through. They can be different. They can be like tiered in terms of like how they they work. Uh, there are different configurations. Uh, from the start, just to like safely uh, innovate in this category of uh, of uh, of protocols, I think there's going to be a committee restakings mostly, and then most of them like will will go resolve, uh, resolver less, and uh, like probably like or or go into route of like proof, you know, ZK proofs or fraud proofs, but that remains to be seen. Yeah. I'm actually also curious if you think slashing is important. I mean, if we look at the, you know, the history of proof of stake, right? The, first of all, if you look at in the amount of money that has been uh, sort of slashed, it's very, very, very tiny. You also had the case that actually... For example, when Cosmos launched, Cosmos today has like so Atom, Cosmos Hub has 5% uh, slashing. Uh, so 5% of the t state tokens can be slashed. Actually, I remember when Cosmos launched, the idea was, oh, we're going to launch like that uh, because it's, you know, beta, it's new, but then later we will increase. Uh, but of course, it never increased. And honestly, nobody ever pushed for it to be increased. Uh, when Solana launched, they were also, oh, it's beta, it's new, so we are going to launch without slashing. And then totally actually at the time was talking about, oh, maybe we're going to have 100% slashing later. And if you double sign it, but today Solana, many years later, it's become very, very successful, very big proof of stake network, and it doesn't have any slashing. Uh, Avalanche doesn't have slashing, right? So do you think slashing is important? Do you imagine that like, there would be regular slashing events or do you imagine like, do you think there will also might be a lot of chains that, uh, or chains or, or decentralized systems that symbiotic, that are using symbiotic that don't use slashing at all? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I expect, uh, I expect some category of networks uh, to, to not have slashing at all. Uh, for them, stake is going to be just gatekeeping uh like mechanism and voting mechanism you get enough reputation for people to vote for your network because the money are still limited for the supply uh, and you get like to gatekeep the operator set uh like the basically the delegation without slashing for some networks it works uh, like in, in case of solana by the way like the, it's the only major blockchain that was not available for like days on end so I think that that like no slashing gruel backfired for them like multiple times, and I'm like I'm sure that we'll see more fun news from them as well uh, in the future. Well, I, I I don't know if that has a lot to do with the slashing though. The Solana downtime, I think that's different. No, like if actual people will, will was were slashed, I think they would take this outage more seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, for some networks, slashing is inevitable. Like if it's straight up, we, we have like multiple uh, threshold networks securing a lot of stake and a lot of like, uh, like wallets that are really like high, high volume. 
uh, for Oracle networks, slashing might be like really essential if their oracles are like option based or like calculation based. And uh, for for some networks, even ZK coprocessor networks, UX slashing is going to be really important because if they don't perform within a, within a, like some small window, they might deliver a lot of like uh, a lot of harm to users. For a tester network, th this might be really important because like what what's stopping you from like issuing an attestation that like you received transaction and transaction is finalized when you actually don't have that and like the like exchanges are gonna get hurt or some people are gonna get hurt in process or like arbiters uh, arbiters are gonna be hurt. Yeah, for pre-confirmation, it's obviously a big deal because like people, if they don't have like the other leg uh, somewhere or like included in a block, they will lose a lot of money. So that they might be immediate harm. For blockchains with like with modern consensus mechanisms, yeah, the harm is like limited a lot. Uh, so they might like skip their leg day and disable uh, or not enable, uh, yeah, not enable uh, the the slashing altogether. I think the will the the, the shared security will help find this like sweet spot uh, because like the difference is going to be quite noticeable, uh, just because like the, exp the overall experience will be more streamlined. And you will will have like two networks launching at the same time, one with slashing, the other one with not without. Uh, and see like how it goes from both sides. So, what about Im immutability of the symbiotic contracts? Is that something where you think they should be like fixed, immutable? Is there a role for governance there? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, like it was. This was the hard part to actually design a system to be as flexible as it is but still immutable at, at its core. Like it took us eight months to do that. Uh, yeah, we did, as with everything else, the goal was for us to cater to as much possible network types and like business type uh, types and token types and uh, participant types as possible. And we just wanted to eliminate the government's risk. Uh, for now, yeah, there is no way to upgrade the contracts. Uh, because like we we don't want people ever being concerned with that. This is like in the same trope for us to to reach optimization uh, as, uh, with the highest uh, with the highest rate of like with with the highest success success rate possible. And for that, yeah, like there there's no way for us to introduce fees first, and there is no way for us to upgrade the contracts. So yeah. Like the, there is no there is no like governance inside, at least for the con core part of the contracts. And then, do you imagine? I mean, with Uniswap, it was kind of like that too, right? It was V two and then V three. So, do you also imagine there will be uh, sort of later versions of Symbiotic, like um, similar to like how Uniswap upgraded? Yeah, that might be one of the uh, tropes for us, one of the p possible pathing. There might be others, like uh, the core, that depends on like how the actual market starts. Uh, if we were like amazingly diligent during this like eight months that we were like developing the architecture, and if we were so great that we designed the system to work for with V1 forever and account for every possible use case, then yeah, sure. Like V1 is gonna be it for a while, but we 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 have like uh, that they're one hundred percent gonna be optimization in auxiliary systems and like per, well upgradable parts. Uh, then the core is gonna be just widely reused by everyone forever, and uh, the like the actual value add is gonna be reached through auxiliary systems. If like we identified like and this is like probably closer to what will happen. Uh, if we identify it, we haven't yet, like, full disclosure. We For now, the core works ideally, like, it works great. But, like, the, they, when the industry starts and then matures, if we identify something, there's, of course, going to be, like, we, we like, if we identify value yet that will warrant people migrating from V1 to v, V2, same as Uniswap. Of course, there's going to be an upgrade path for us. 
it's just designed to be like migrated as like secure as possible. So people would, would actually need to opt in into every version. So uh, currently, what are some of the things that people are building on Symbiotic that, you know, you're most excited about and you feel like they're the best examples of how you want the system to be used? Uh, I, I don't pick and choose. This is the neutrality part. Like I love all of my children, uh, <laughs> but uh, equally, but, uh, yeah, we have like uh, el almost everything we were like out for, uh, in the wild for around like three and a half months, I guess. Uh, and since then we got around 40 networks, 30 something like, closer to 30, 40 or already, I think like couple of pre-confirmations, couple of data availability, 304 fast finality, uh, or two Oracle networks, uh, one or two agent based, uh, network, uh, for inference, uh, ZK coprocessors, uh, a couple of thresholds, couple of, uh, no one, uh, I think, uh, fully homomorphic encryption network. Yeah, like basically everything, a roll kit for rollups on even on Celestia, uh, like several TASI for, for substrate based, uh, like, uh, rollup de deployment uh, and network deployment, uh, like several SDKs. Yeah. We have basically every, every primitive in terms of the centralized networks, uh, like uh, already on us, like building on us. Excited for all of them, but more excited for the ones that launched before 2025. <laughs> yeah, like this is the, the, the only metric where that I can score people over. Like, are you going to be actually launching uh, before, before the end of the year or like, or after, because that each, each network, uh, that launches helps the others to, to see the light and to get the optimization. Because if you consider currently like. The zero AVSs or networks are actually launched. So if you're considering being launched centralized, being going through decentralization journey alone, uh, with like your team only, uh, or launching with shared security, it's not an like easy decision, but the more networks actually launch, even the AVSs, the more, the more of like the, when they start launching, the more of them launch uh into full production the more you'll have the menu uh, that you can select from and get inspiration from and to actually like sway to, to sway you in the direction of shared security and that's what we want so you just mentioned timelines so what are what are the main milestones that are coming up for symbiotic yeah we're gonna launch mainnet soon uh getting toward that towards that for a while uh we just wait for networks to be ready because we don't want anyone to rush in and it's going to be full production. So like every functionality, uh, available from our side. Yeah. Like th this is going to be a, a big one. Uh, and then yeah, to scale up, uh, orient teams better orient, help validators to and operators to be as efficient as, as possible with this new paradigm. And, uh, yeah, like overall coordination work. We have multiple teams building resolvers, uh, teams building SDKs, teams building frameworks for networks to reuse. Uh, so yeah, after mainland and like we currently are getting to a point where the actual good questions are starting to be started to be asked, uh, not the conceptual ones, but like actual UX questions. Like what's the lockup period that I need to use, like to get the most LRTs? What's the, I don't know, like, how do I approach a uh, validator, like validators? I don't want to talk to like each one of them, other consortiums of them, are there groups of them I can reach out to? Like, I, I don't want to, to have like 12 chats. I want to have one. Is it possible for me to get the best like validator set available for with just one chat? And uh, like, we are getting to optimization part of it because like, there are a lot of like concept work, but, uh, in terms of like, do we need that at all? Like the, 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 a lot of questions that, uh, people ask when they don't have an actual problem to be solved immediately for networks. It's like, it's applied, like really applied. 
they they want they just want them like hey, okay how do i get the best operator set that that investors are getting off my back immediately how do i get the the stake amount so i can like launch protocols without and tell them that i have enough support how do i get the 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 best like uh, the 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 tech stack that i can immediately reuse and like develop as, as little as possible to get to the product market fit that i can actually like uh, start testing cool excellent well thank you so much misha it's been uh, it's been really great to have you on i'm excited i think it's a uh... I think it's, I think Symbiotic is going to give rise to a tremendous amount of like interesting experiments around staking, around how to operate, how to launch, how to operate, how to secure decentralized systems. And yeah, I'm, I'm super thrilled to see like what, what's going to come out of that. So um, thanks so much for coming on and thanks so much for, yeah, giving us this update. Thank you. Yeah. Interested, que interesting questions. Thank you for that. Uh, I'm super happy to be here and super happy to spread the mission and ideas.